When we first started talking about building this company, I said to people, we're going to bring in alcohol-free product and we're going to sell it. And they were like, oh, that's really great for pregnant people. I kind of like scratched my head and I was like, is that the only people that don't drink alcohol in the world? And so we started figuring out, oh, we need to really educate people on when they don't drink. So it's not just people that are pregnant. It's also those that are breastfeeding. It's also those that are on medication. It's also the person that drives the vehicle for work. It's also people that holds an important job in government. It's also the person that drives a bus or saves lives. There's so many reasons why you are drinking a beverage, but you're not drinking an alcoholic one. Hello and welcome to D2C Podcast. I'm Eric Dick. Today we're fully present with Fiona Hefer, co-founder of Sensorium, an alcohol-free marketplace with a highly curated selection of non-alcoholic wine, beer, spirits, aperitifs, and more. Join us for a wide-ranging discussion about the billion-dollar industry that's just waking up, without a hangover, mind you, and is predicted to grow to over $4 billion by 2030. You'll hear how pop-ups have fueled growth for Sansorium on the D2C and wholesale side of the market, why half of the battle for alcohol-free brands is brand design and positioning. You'll also hear how Fiona thinks about accelerating the sea change towards sobriety. You might even hear me talking myself out of post-hockey beers. What is the world coming to? On with the show. In 2023, say goodbye to operational constraints and skewed demand predictions. Printful Enterprise is here to take all of that off your plate with white label on-demand production. Reach your global customer base with more cost efficiency than ever and offer them a wide range of premium quality products from apparel to home decor. Printful will fulfill pack and ship orders all under your brand. Team up with a player who will always be dedicated to your growth. Team up with Printful Enterprise. We did at D2C and we've never looked back. Learn more at printful.com slash enterprise. That's printful.com slash enterprise. Join the team. Fiona, welcome to the D2C podcast. Can you just start by telling me why you built Sensorium? Ooh, um, uh, sort of a kismet dream in the making. I could, I could sense that in my, I kind of worked in the wellness retail space for a long time. And I have a deep passion and a bit of a training in social innovation. And so I'm always looking ahead at ways that um, social problems or spaces or environments can be disrupted and changed and shifted. And I could see in my previous um, area that I was working in, I could see that sobriety or the conversation around our relationship with alcohol was coming to the surface. It was about to be challenged. And I, I, I told a few people about this in a, in a boardroom and got a little laugh and they thought I was crazy, <laughs> which is, um, which is ironic <laughs> for the folks in the room, but they were, they were just not ready yet. And I could see that it was ahead of its time. This is in 2019, 2018. And then in, in 2020, my mom decided she was going to stop drinking alcohol. And she had known that I was in and out of a sober state for years out of my own just disinterest in alcohol. But she was, she was a old true diehard fan of that bottle of wine at the end of a long day or end of a long week. And I grew up with that classic kind of wine mom who would just pour herself a big, beautiful glass of Sauvignon Blanc at the end of the day of a hard work day and reward herself and when she decided to stop drinking alcohol, it turned all of us to looking at non-alcoholic wine and non-alcoholic cocktails because she wanted to continue the ritual of drinking, but she just didn't want any alcohol anymore. So we drank everything from the grocery store and the bottom of the liquor store shelf. And it satisfied a tiny bit of our desire, but not the full spectrum of it and certainly wasn't the right quality and it wasn't up to um there was just not a lot of variety and it really wasn't fun the way it used to be so at the end of 2020 we had this little idea that we'd start looking for other products and when we went searching around the world we found all these amazing brands that had no presence in canada at all and if we wanted to bring them in we were paying 
hundreds of dollars in duties and shipping and but they didn't even have the we didn't even have access to bring them in sometimes but places like australia and the uk were doing so well and the us was growing their their brand presence and so we thought maybe there's a little tiny opportunity for us um, to start something and i was kind of coming out of my previous work and my mom was finishing up her uh, second retirement she was ready to hightail it back into uh, the workforce but wasn't wanting to work for anybody else so we literally came together at the right time and uh, it was I always say it's a it's a FaceTime that changed my life it was her her FaceTime to me in the beginning of 2021 that said I want us to do this and I really want to do it with you I think I need you and we built we started building what is now Sensorium um, we first wanted to import products. We taught ourselves how to import. And then we I knew that we needed a platform that was going to be community-centered, design-centered, really gave the whole industry a facelift uh, because it did have a poor reputation before we got there. And there were some people already doing it in, in, in Canada, but we're kind of, it was a bit of a side hustle. It wasn't truly everyone's MO. So I I really knew that we needed to come in with, with the right, uh, the right approach, the right strategy and talk to people in a new way. How does it go? Like, it's interesting, you know, instead of going, um, to start a product, right. You think of like a marketplace because really that solves your problems. Like how do I get access to this, you know, to the high end product that you kind of have to seek out a little bit. What was your first move when you built like marketplaces have a bit of a chicken or egg problem sometimes, right? They need to have the customers and the revenue at the same time. Did you make deals with vendors or were you buying products and shipping them out, taking the risk up front? Yes. So two big problems, brand new industry, <laughs> very little consumer and, uh, heavy to ship. Heavy, heavy <laughs> product, glass and liquid. Yeah, like yeah. big shipping companies, worst nightmare is, is shipping our product. Um, they don't want to take on any liability. So we, and nobody knew who we were. We didn't even have a website. We kind of went, we approached these vendors that we thought, okay, they're doing really well. Like, you know, they're, they're not like super, super huge yet. Maybe we could get in when they're small and we could help them grow. And so we had some strategy about who we were approaching in other countries, but they took a chance on us with no terms. So we had to come up with all the money ourselves. Cause they're like, if we sell this product to these strangers in Canada, <laughs> we can't give them terms. So we had to put everything up front, buy pallet loads of product because you can't ship a couple of cases from Australia without blowing your margins right away. So we were bringing pallet loads of product in and it was a real, it was a real chance. But what I knew for sure is that I wasn't going to be able to just purchase these products and give them right into another retail store at a wholesale price and expect them to fly off the shelves. This was a two part challenge. This was building the community of D 2 C customers and the wholesale customer at the same time. So it was like this twofold you know, challenge. And I come from a background in building community. So I knew I could do that. I knew that I could really educate and challenge the social sphere around alcohol and help to drive those people into restaurants and stores and other marketplaces in the country to purchase the product in a, in a, in a wholesale place. So where did you start when you decided to cult? So you invested big and maybe you were cultivating this audience ahead of time on social media, but talk a little bit about cultivating that audience to bring it to the product that you had so much faith in. Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing we realized early on was people needed to taste this product and they needed a chance to taste more than one at a time. They needed to see that it wasn't just a fluke that one product was great and the rest were all going to be, you know, half, half the, the decent experience. So we have basically put all of our marketing dollars into pop-ups and tastings, in-person tastings. Um, we've grown our social completely organically up until now. This is actually the second month we've been able to start advertising. So everything from launch September, 2021 till now has been organic and we just literally hit the ground. We just hit the pavement. We've been, we've hosted over 60 pop-ups ourselves in the last year. 
um, sometimes three in a week, sometimes twice in a day, sometimes three in a weekend. And we've, we, we stay in Vancouver, we go out to the Tri-Cities, we go out into, you know, surrounding areas um, and meet as many people as we can. And we're literally changing people's minds one, one sip of a drink at a time. And those people become online customers. They find us at other pop-ups. They send their friends to us. And it's, it's this like little, you know, spiral of activity that's, that's happened. But I would say it's, it's really the in-person conversations, this long form style of conversion that we're dealing with. And you, and you mentioned it off the top too, but it's also the brand and the attention to, to, to design on the brand. I think it, the, the aesthetic, I think, and the brand itself really plays well into it. What is a Sansorium? Where, where did the brand name come from? Yeah, so we worked with a well-known agency in Vancouver, Glassford & Walker. And what we both came up with was we wanted, uh, we wanted to return the sensuality back into not drinking alcohol. For a long time, the word sober and the and, and words associated with sobriety have been dry or um, mock or fake. Um, Negative words, even non, <laughs> even non, right? Like, non, yeah. Yeah. And, and then also alcoholic. So like you're non-alcoholic. So you're, that's like a double negative at the same time. Yeah. Um, so I said, I want people to realize that there is a true sensuality in not consuming alcohol, that there is more feeling to be had, that there's more life to be had, that it's like technicolor vision because you're not dulling any of the senses. You're not trying to numb yourself. You're trying to feel more. So how can we bring that back? Like, what does that mean? And they, they, after going away and working around it, they came and they popped up a whole bunch of words on a screen, a bunch of names, and I was like, it's that one. It's like I had already known. It's, it's sensorium, the, this, the root of the word sensorium, and the idea that it's an emporium, a place that you can go to to feel and to have pleasure. I was like, it's done. That's the one. Um, so we moved and we jived with that, and it, we just wanted color. We wanted simplicity from the, 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 the sort of nature of the brand. Um, so our color palette is fairly simple sometimes, but I always explode things with color and with luscious words and you know part of our tag is delicious like there's just so much to be had and i just want people to feel that when they're when they greet us when they meet us and when they take the product away very cool uh with your pop-ups with your reckless pop-up schedule which is just amazing to, to pound the pavement like that um it and you know you're you, are you optimizing for sales at the events as well as making an impression there? And then my my follow up is like what what are, what are your return rates like on people who who sort of uh, buy from you once? Mm -hmm. So yes, we usually bring and this is all thanks to my mom. This she's a true host. She wants she never wants anyone to go without. So we always have more than enough product at every pop up. I'm the one that's like let's sell out of this. You know, make demand. And she's like never. So we always have enough product. In fact, we look like we are a permanent liquor store when you walk into a pop-up. Like we're always here, but no, we've just popped up that day. Um, so you can always purchase. If we do run out of something, which does happen, we'll make sure we ship it to you free of charge the next day. So you will get that product as soon as possible. Um, and the return rate, I mean, it's hard to calculate return rate on in-person I, I could start a loyalty program. This might actually inspire me to do that for in-person pop-ups. Uh, but the goal is to simplify everyone's lives and to utilize the marketplace. So get online, um, place your order, ships to you within you know a day of it going on to our site. And if it's on the Friday, Monday morning, it's at the warehouse. You'll get it in one to two days if you're in the lower mainland two to three days if you're outside that and up to five in the rest of the country and down into the U S now, cause we just opened up U S. Uh, so it's very convenient. We have a very simple shipping model. So it's flat rate across the board. Um, there's a two different tiers, but it's very simple. So you can get so much product. And then if you buy $150 or more, it's free. You know, we just really want to take care of people and remove any barriers to online shipping and to ordering of liquid glass bottles <laughs> because I do know that that is a bit of a a fear for some people is 
breaking in transit and that kind of thing. So we try and move that. But online, we average between 20 and 30% return rate. That's so cool. Yeah. And are you doing – like, and it's, just, it's it's the strength of the product, I guess. It's how you kind of curate the product and and then how you display it to users. Is there anything else in that process? Are there handwritten notes? Or are you sending sending anything along with the, the product? Yeah, we do. We include a little thank you card. It's, you know, signed yeah. off by me, my mom, and my sister, who's also heavily involved in our, our company and helped us start it. Um, our customer service is bar none. My mom does the most incredible job of taking care of people. And I, I'm sad for the day when we've reached too large of a business that she cannot give you this level of service. But maybe she'll just try and replicate herself in every city because she loves that if something goes wrong, she's back on email with you in 10 minutes and making sure that you are so updated about where your order is. We often get emails back saying, this was the best customer I've ever had. This was the easiest uh, solution I've ever seen. You know, thanks for taking care of it. I wasn't expecting you to do that. You know, lots of emails like that. So um it's definitely her, she's in her dharma in, in this role and taking care of our customers. And I think that's probably why we do get second chances if our career company has failed us <laughs> or we, we make a human error and we forget to put your product in the box, you know, accidentally and you'll get two. you know, like we'll just really take yeah. care of people above and beyond. Yeah. That's really cool. The foundation of so many of the businesses that I talk to are based on sort of the idea of things that don't scale. Uh, you know, and like literally just doing, going that extra mile, do you know, uh, those extra details, especially in the beginning matter so much. And they, they can, even when you expand the business, they stay good businesses. They stay a huge part of the DNA and the footprint, obviously. Yeah, um, it's, it's true. It's also this weird, it's, it's an opportunity because early adopters are usually people in my experience who are very forgiving. So you're, you know, we get a lot of people like, oh, it doesn't matter. I'm just so thankful that I was able to find you, that I'm so thankful that you exist, that I can order product from you. So it's almost a little bit of a false representation of the future <laughs> because once you hit mainstream, you're not going to have that many forgiving folks. They're just going to be like, you're a service that I, that I should be able to access 24 seven. What is this? Um, so I'm, I'm really treasuring this unique time in our first one to two years where we have such loyal customers and such um, care we're cared for by the people as well. You know, they thank us for coming out and standing in the cold at a pop-up. Like they thank me. It's, it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to ask about, um, I know we have a lot of listeners of the podcast readers of the newsletter who are actually built beverage companies. I know we have, a, I've just ran into a fair amount of beverage companies, fair amount of non-alcoholic or de-alcoholized products. I, as someone who sees all these products and curates them, do you have any advice for people building products in the space for how to kind of stand out? Oh my goodness. I mean, I take, I, I take advice or I take sort of my learnings from watching people buy alcohol. Um, I've stood in liquor stores before and done tastings for, for our brands and watched customers walk into liquor stores quite blind. They'll just pick bottles off the shelves and they've never tried it before. They look at the label, they look at the price point, they look at what's kind of around it. And that's all they're going off of. Maybe they'll ask the person that works there if it's good, but that likely that person hasn't tried it. So I'm so sorry, but half of your product is the branding. Half of your product is the package. And a lot of people don't nail that. Um, and they don't have their positioning right. And they don't have, uh, you know, language on a bottle is also so important. I know one of our brands, he ummed and odd for months about calling it a non-alcoholic product or an alcohol-free product. Like he had to really think about positioning the freedom in alcohol-free or the non-alcoholic in the ease of understanding what that means. So sit with it. Be like really test it with lots of different people and spend the money on a good designer. Don't go cheap. Don't do it yourself. If you don't have a background in design, you can spend the money. That's really what will pay off in the long run. Yeah. I think that's great advice. Um, you, 
in the early on, you mentioned the two big pieces of the business was the D2C and then wholesale. What have been the biggest levers for you to grow wholesale? I imagine it's similar. It's sort of meet and greets. It's getting getting hands in products. But what, what's been the, yeah, the biggest win on the wholesale side? The biggest win on the wholesale side. Well, first, it's our commitment to building consumer. So consumers have driven wholesale, hands down. We get people saying, oh, I've heard customers talk about you and they want me to reach out to you. Amazing. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, we do a lot of... We do a lot of reach outs. I do spend a lot of money on sampling with uh, with wholesale customers, potentials. Um, and that's the thing is I could go in and open up 10 bottles for one person and they don't place an order after that. And, you know, I might use my little device, a Coravin, to open up the wine properly and not, you know, waste the whole bottle. But for some spirits that I have to open, full-size bottles for... Um, beer for ciders, some aperitifs, that's it. You know, and I, if I don't have a tasting for another week, I'm not bringing that product again. I'm opening up a new set. So it's very expensive and it's very costly. But what people do appreciate immensely is I think about their menu really carefully and I think, what can you swap out alcohol and swap in the alcoholics for? So if you have, um, you know, a tequila style cocktail and menu, I'll, I'll bring over some tequila for you. Um, I'm not going to bring you some random thing that you've never heard of because that's just going to be friction for me trying to over-educate you and you don't have even the time for that, you know? So if I see you, you have a really great brunch menu, I'll bring in a sparkling wine. I know you can make mimosas with that in five seconds. Easy. Um, I just want it to be easy. And I think the, my approachability, Plus my strategy and my planning for the, for these tastings is really helpful. And, and we also just have, yeah, like you said, a, a, as a curator, we've really curated our collection. So other marketplaces like us in Canada can benefit from the types of products we've brought in because they know we've done the due diligence and tasting and these are award-winning products. They can just pop those on their site and they'll do well right away. Um, so a lot of the marketplaces you'll see in Canada buy from us. And that's done really well. And then also negotiating really great pricing on products that we don't import, but that we source in Canada. You can come to us as a one-stop shop, as a restaurant. You don't have to go to any other agency because we can basically sell you every vertical of product out there. And we get lots of other products that you can buy from us. So I think it's that. It's a whole bunch of really good customer service and really good product curation. Normally here, you'll hear my announcer voice telling you about one of our partner's great e-commerce SaaS businesses, but today I get to tell you about my thing and invite you to C-Suite Mastermind, Las Vegas, March 23rd and 24th. 2023. In September, we ran our first in-person mastermind in Victoria, British Columbia. It was a smash success and a clear sign to keep bringing together the top minds of our industry for concentrated learning and relationship building events. So now we can all meet up in Las Vegas, March 23rd and 24th, just ahead of Shop Talk. Check out directtoconsumer.co slash events to see the lineup of amazing mentors we're bringing to the table, including the Midday Squares trio, the founders and operators behind Obvi Collagen, Mini Katana, Kuru Footwear, and more. So whether you're building in CPG, health, apparel, or even bladed weaponry, we're going to have the content and connections at C-Suite that make a serious impact to your results in 2023. So that's directtoconsumer.co slash events and Viva Las Vegas and let's go. You know, I, I definitely feel the sea change just among friends that I know. I feel it myself in my 40s when I'm like, I, I go out for drinks after a, a, a game of hockey and I always feel it the next day. I always feel a little bit less. I always have a fun time in the moment, but I always do. I'm feeling it more and more. So there's, there's a personal sea change. There's a, there's a, a, a cultural sea change out there happening. First of all, like wh how, what's, what, what, do you view as the as the total addressable market of of this is is the first question, and mm -hmm. then my next question is what are you doing to like accelerate these conversations or accelerate this sea change? Where I remember in our pre interview you mentioned where you have this vision where at at, at fine restaurants you'll have the option waiters will need to carry four bottles of like red yeah. and white and <laughs> uh, you know alcohol and non and just yeah. sort of like as the as the default option. So mm -hmm. first question, how big do you think the market is? Second, how are you going to spread the word? So my first, when we first started talking about building this company and I said to people, you know, we're going to bring in alcohol-free product and we're going to sell it. And they were like, 
oh, that's really great for pregnant people. And I kind of like scratched my head and I was like, is that the only people that don't drink alcohol in the world? Surely not. Surely not. That's not the only group. And so we started figuring out, oh, we need to really educate people on when they don't drink and when there's an opportunity for them to not be an alcoholic drinker. So, okay, well then it's not just people that are pregnant. It's also those that are breastfeeding. It's also those that are on medication. It's also the person that drives a vehicle for work. It's also people that holds, you know, an important job in government. It's also a person that drives a bus or, you know, carries a, a, a weapon for work or, saves lives. There's so many reasons why you are drinking a beverage, but you're not drinking an alcoholic one. To add to the fact, you've got folks that are from an addiction background that need to stop drinking alcohol. That's a whole other category. And then there's the people that are just not into it. They just don't feel like it anymore. They might want to tomorrow, but today they don't. Or they might want to in three hours, but right now they don't. There's always a reason for someone there's, to not think. There's such a stream of like entrepreneurs and techies as well, like the Andrew Huberman life hacker people. There's so exactly. many among among the, the, these group of influencers that are just mm-hmm. re- recognizing that it's not worth it for them as well. I see that as yeah, a huge absolutely. segment for you. It's huge. And so what used to be uh, 1% turned into 50% because 50% of the world religiously or culturally don't drink alcohol. And then it turned into actually 100% of the world has the has a reason to not drink alcohol at some point in their day, week, month, year, life. And it's about, for me, it's about letting them know that we're available and that it's there's no longer a stigma. So my job is to disrupt the stigma and to have new conversations. And a lot of that is this. A lot of that is driving long-form you know, style conversations so that there's the space because in seven seconds that you have to capture somebody on an ad, it might not work. (laughs) It might not grab them. Um, And I'm fine with that. I really am. I want people that are interested in change, not because it's a trend, but because it's a choice, a lifestyle choice. And that's what going alcohol free means. Really. It's a, it's autonomy. Um, And we have to have conversations about autonomy in multiple ways, Um, you know, because it's beyond alcohol for me. Sobriety is beyond alcohol for me. It's, it's a choice to be grounded. It's a choice to be clear. It's a choice to be, you know, in, in, in very, it's very confident. It's a very confident choice. And I'm not going to be swayed by someone anymore. That's like, come on, why aren't, Why aren't you having a drink tonight? You know, why not? Why not? It's not about you. It's not about, it's just, it's just for me. And if me not drinking makes you feel challenged, that's about you, man. That's not about me. And I'll let that, I'll let you sit with that. Um, So all of this is about autonomy. And, and walking the path yourself, it sounds like. That sounds like a big part of it, living, living the example and talking about it, spreading the word through things like podcasts. Um, are you, do you ever have conversations with people in restaurants? Like, do you ever like, Hey, would you guys ever consider offering non the alcohol? Cause I bet there are like, there's a, probably, there's probably a, a lot of like a new breed of restaurants that are more open to that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's restaurants that in their pre-opening call us and then we go do samplings for them and they figure out what their non-alcoholic menu is going to look like before they've even opened, which I love. Um, I also talk to restaurants about how they position their menus. So great. You've got a non-alcoholic menu on the very back page at the bottom next to kids juices. That's not going to make me feel like spending money. I'm a, clearly it's an afterthought. Clearly it's a, maybe this person might check for it. And it's the very back. I would like to see an integrated menu. As I mentioned to you before, I'd like a, a bartender to say, Hey, what would you like for a drink? Do you want something with or without alcohol as a starting point to not assume that what I want is alcohol, but to assume I want to drink a beverage because I'm at their establishment. Um, that, yeah, that to me, I do often have conversations that to me is really important. And I just like the kind of banter you can have at a restaurant and see how people get, you know, a little bit thrown off by me asking for something, but it's changing. It definitely is totally. changing. Yeah. 
The thing that I found in, in situations where I haven't drank is always that you end up feeling the, the good parts of being in those situations isn't all, isn't necessarily from the alcohol. It's from being around friends. It's from being in a social environment. And you end up crediting alcohol with a lot of the positive aspects that are just of being present with people. Mm -hmm. A thousand percent. I, yeah. I was talking about this with somebody recently um, that big alcohol has really made us think that there is something inherently missing in us and in our surrounding environment that they can fix, that the alcohol is there to solve, that I'm not comfortable enough, that I'm not fun enough, that I'm not social enough, that I'm... I can't something. relax enough. I've worked so hard and I, I'm so worked up. I can't even relax enough without this, this, this without alcohol. Exactly. Yeah. And that's through marketing, but also the effect of alcohol. In that first initial sip in five minutes and 10 minutes, I will absolutely credit the biological effect of alcohol in making your nervous system relax. It's the longer bent, it's the longer drinking period that doesn't benefit you long term. So, sure, if you're going to have a few sips over five minutes, I'm sure that's going to be fine. But when you, when it crosses over into that, binge drinking, you know, two, three, four, we've lost all effect of that little drop of the shoulders. Now we're into another, another phase. Um, so yeah, big alcohol has done a real good one on us and unlearning that is for some people kind of painful and, and challenging because it really forces you to, you know, pull out the cards of your personality and go, you know, how do I want to show up right now? Am I, am I fun on the table, you know, going wild, hair flying around? Maybe. That's cool. Am I actually a little bit more uh, quiet and reserved and I like to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation? Great. Awesome. Just know yourself. Just know because then you're not pushing yourself into environments that are going to make you want to drink to be like other people. You know, just be yourself. I love it. We don't verge into personal development that much on the podcast, but I really appreciate it. Let's get back to ads now. I got to... <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned, you I mentioned, throw it in. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, it was great. On our, but you mentioned on our pre-interview that you were just starting ads. You mentioned that it was a rocky road with ads because of Facebook thinking that you are not, you know, an alcoholized wine. Can you just talk a little bit about your journey with ads and how it's working now? Yes. I mean, we, I, I still, I got an email just yesterday about being rejected for something. It's not news to me anymore. Um, so from the beginning, from launching my shop on Facebook and getting that dreaded long email 72 hours later that every one of my products had been rejected, stating that they were alcohol, uh, I did not know how long that road was going to be at the time. And I did not know how many other people were also going to be in the same position as me. Then I got on a, a symposium call about a week ago with uh, 20, 30, 40 other marketplaces around the world like mine. And we all have had the same problem around the whole world. And one, um, one brand in, in the U.S., Boisson, totally going to call them out because they're doing great work. They have been speaking to Facebook and they are trying to move a category along that will recognize an alcoholic product. Now, what I know is that the, what he told me is that, uh, or told us, the group, is that they would rather, and this is like LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, everyone, they would rather non-alcoholic product not um, get approved than an alcohol product slipping in and getting into the wrong hands. Fair. But I think that there's enough ways that I can prove this is a non-alcoholic product and get it verified and get my company verified because literally I have no intention of selling alcohol <laughs> probably ever. Let's just say, I think there's enough ways that I can get that verified then. And, and let's, let's pull out like the 99% rule. 99% of us are going to do good at this. There's probably going to be 1% of us that don't and get something slipped in and it'll be an accident. But let's not rule all of us out, you know? Let's not harm all of our businesses that are trying to disrupt and change society for the better and not give us access to people. When, giving, when you give 
lots of alcoholic brands, tons of exposure, tons of ad um, capabilities, and t- tons of shop capabilities. I it hurts me to see an alcoholic ad, to be honest with you. Not because of the alcohol, but because I don't get approved and you do. Uh, it's very challenging. Yeah. Well, if, if Facebook, if you're listening, Meta, if you're listening, I know some of you are. Let's let's get together on the on the NA movement. It's just it just be great press for them, if nothing else, right? Like, just think about that. Like, Meta needs some good press these days. The positive impact that you know having these products in people's lives in other ways might might definitely outweigh the negative. I would say it, it really would. I think the, yeah. the 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 thing that I have to do is kind of convolute my language and convolute the brand and have these weird sort of um, like saying, I, I feel like non alk, which is like kind of like a half word. And it's just, I have to do these weird things to get the message across and that gets approved, but a bottle won't get it. Like the cover of a bottle won't get it. Being approved. sneaky, you know, finding the little sneaks in there. I was in the CBD space a little bit before this and, and trying to, you know, playing that game with CBD as well. It's like not a, not a good way to build a long-term business. No, um, no. for sure. So some people have figured it out, you know, some people, and we're all helping each other, which is really great too. So watch out. I know you're listening, Meta and Facebook. Watch out. We're coming for you as a group. Big, big Bacardi's here too. Big alcohol listens too, I think too. You, so you, they, they know you're coming for them. Yeah, just let's work together. This is um, it's a huge space and a huge opportunity. And if you want to be part of the change, this is a really like, a huge catalyst for us is, is having more flexibility on social. Here's a question. Right now, if I were to give you 50000 dollars canadian let's call them canadian dollars because we're both yeah, canadian uh, well, how would you put that and you have to use it in 2022 is is the thing if you have to use it in 2020 well no actually you've got you can use it into q1 of 2023 as well how would you use that that marketing that budget oh i wish i could be super creative about this but okay i've got two ideas my first idea because this is a real challenge for us is i would invest in product um, there are, there are some really great brands that I want to bring up from the U S and I have the demand. I have the consumer. They're waiting for these products. I just don't have the cash flow to be, able to, to be able to invest in the quantities that I need to bring in. And this is for the brands that I want to bring in and the brands that I already carry. So like I would literally probably send that money to my best winery in Australia and just bring over the product because I literally have people that want it right away. Um, my more creative idea is I would love to see uh, I would love to see Sensorium present in in really cool ways in different retailers across the country, and you know we can get into the grocery store if we want, but I think that's I don't think we're ready to shop for non-alcoholic wine in particular at a grocery store level. That's not been a Canadian's um, buying practice in the past, so we're not we're a little early for that. But there's a bunch of really cool stores across the country that I could see a sensorium presence in. I, I'd love to like blow out some fridge space or like make it fun because um, we have the freedom to. We're not an alcoholic brand. We, we can be pretty easy with where we spread ourselves. So I'd love to, I'd love to do that. Um, but if you're offering money, I'll... Uh, <laughs> I'll take it. Oh, you're the first person to actually ask me if it's real. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's funny. We'll, uh, we're working on something in the background. I'll let you know uh, when we yeah, get our okay. angel fund up. But I, I think we're pretty well positioned, so it might be a good idea. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I just think you're in such an interesting spot. I think there's. I think the uh, the movement is just growing. I was just looking at a list of celebrities. There's so many, you know, a bunch of celebrities that have kind of jumped on board. There's probably a lot of opportunity to to be in the news and to and to news jack. I, I know we talked a little bit in the pre talk about a podcast as well. I think you're obviously so passionate about this stuff, and I can't I, I can never advise people enough to to start their podcast and start having these conversations, um, and just give people another reason to to listen to you. Um, and I think it's, I, I, I think it's for marketplaces, it's even more, I think, you know, there's the prediction with Mr. Beast and, uh, you know, other things that, that in the future you'll need to be a bit of a media company in order to hold your audience's attention. And I imagine the same will be true for marketplaces as well, especially for marketplaces that are trying to be disruptive in, uh, in how people think about, uh, the wine industry. Yeah, you're so right. And the fact that we are some exclusive representatives for brands out of other countries, I actually am a bit of a media company already. Being that I'm their only person in this whole country 
socializing them, putting them on air, you know, getting them on TV, getting them into press. That's getting them in front of eyeballs at events and everything, right? Yeah, yeah literally. That's yeah, media too. I'm doing it all. So I would say I, I can predict that we need to make a shift in our model and who's on board from a team perspective by the middle to end of next year that starts to look at, hey, we've literally grown this brand from another country in Canada on our own backs, out of our own pockets. How can they be co-opting into that growth themselves as well? And what kind of support do we need to contain and sustain and grow that company as well? Because it makes both of us money. But it's a little bit challenging to do that on your own accord when you've got eight to nine to 10 brands at a time. That, that sounds like a media company to me. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Uh, well, if you're listening out there and you've been feeling uh, like alcohol isn't doing what it once did for you and you might be looking to, to try something new or you just want to try some delicious beverages, you should go to sensorium.com. Uh, which we'll link out in the show notes here. And it looks like you're having a little bit of a Black Friday sale. It looks like it's probably not a heavy discounting brand, but you have a little bit of a discount running right now? Yeah, we. it depends on the type of product and where we've brought it in from. We are actually doing an up to 40% off sale right now because it's coming up to the end of year for some of our products and um, we want to clear some stuff out so we can buy some new stuff. So we're going to clear some stuff. We've put together sets of different products so that there's – a nice curation for you. You can trust that these all go together or they'll be complimentary to an evening. And um, those are bundled and on sale till the 29th of November. And then we go, you know, in person, we've got pop-ups in the Vancouver and Tri-Cities area until the end of the year, basically. But you can shop until Christmas Eve with us in person. Um, so go to our Instagram. You'll always find in our bio the next location that we'll be at. Or you can go to our website and we have a find us in person and you'll be able to see the pop-up that we'll be at. Awesome. Great chatting, Fiona. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, you can do that right now at directtoconsumer, all one word, dot co. I'm Eric Dick, and this has been the D2C Podcast. We'll see you next time.